So we can see lots of you already tuned in. And um, I hope everybody can see my screen. Fantastic. So good morning. Um, and a very, very warm welcome to everybody who has uh, taken the time to join us this morning from the comfort of their home um, about our uh, impact of COVID-19 on HR webinar series. I hope everybody is uh, uh, comfortable wherever you are, of course, wearing a full suit, I'm sure, for this very important occasion. And uh, we have an exciting uh, few hours ahead of us, packed full of very interesting content uh, for you today. So. My name is Matt DeLuca. I'm the co-founder and managing director of jobnet.com.mm. And um, let me tell you, for those of you who are not exactly aware of what Jobnet does or, or, or you know, how long we've been around, um, what Jobnet does is very relevant to uh, the times we're living in right now. And our guiding principle is um, to help digitize recruitment in Myanmar. Um, we have built a number of tools in Myanmar over the last years aimed at exactly doing that. And specifically, two of the products that we have built um, are the applicant tracking system and the CRM talent database. Um, these are our two flagship products that help essentially digitizing the recruitment uh, process of any company. So to give you an idea about what the CRM can do, imagine you are now at home as an HR professional or a recruiter, and how many paper CVs you've actually left at, uh, at home or in the office, right? So the idea of the CRM is exactly that, is to create a centralized digital searchable database of all your company CVs in one place so that you don't have to worry about searching for uh, paper CVs or Excel files in different parts of the office. Now, we've been doing this for, for a while. In fact, the expertise that we bring to Myanmar spans over 20 years in uh, different, uh, over 15 countries. And um, we are very, very fortunate in Myanmar to be working with uh, the leading organizations in Myanmar, as you can see from, uh, from, from this slide. And in fact, we over, have about over a thousand clients at the moment utilizing our platform. Um, in case you've never tried our systems before, we'd be very eager to show you how it works. So just, just think us later and we'll be very glad to, to be talking to you. Now, besides the online platform, uh, Jobnet also uh, organizes the largest job fairs in Myanmar. And in fact, um, we've now transitioned to fully virtual job fairs as well, and more on that later. Um, lastly, we like to bring uh, to the HR community, uh, we like to bring the HR community together um, quite a few times throughout the year. And um, um, that uh, represents itself, for example, in the Myanmar Employer Awards um, and, uh, and in events like this together. Um, like the Myanmar HR conference, which we organized about 12 times in the past. And today is our first webinar for this. So again, a very warm welcome to all of us who are with us today. And today's topic again is going to be the impact of COVID-19 on HR. I think it's a very relevant topic given the times we live in, particularly given the fact that um, as organizations, as groups of people, we have had to redefine and change significantly the way we work with each other. And the role of HR has played a very central role in managing this transition. Now, we are dealing with an unprecedented global event uh, that has uh, very rapidly had repercussions in virtually all parts of the world. Um, governments and businesses have found themselves having to deal with a crisis that has unfolded with unprecedented speed where every day counts. And like in most cases, uh, like in most crises, uh, many of the parties involved often find themselves caught off guard and many are put even at risk of survival. Overall, there is a lot of speculation about what is going on in Myanmar, uh, but the latest figures point to a somewhat stable outlook uh, with a uh, number of cases stable at 180 cases as of May 11th and no new cases in the last two days. And uh, we believe that's likely partly due to the much lower number of tests to per 1 million population ratio. Um, our latest research uh, from JobNet shows that about 85% of companies are working fully from home. And 65% um, of all corporates, and we define corporates with being companies above 200 employees, 
are actually planning to resume growth and hiring within the next 60 days. So there's somewhat of a positive outlook in the short to medium term. But of course, the SME sector has definitely been hit the hardest, particularly also on a recruitment standpoint. Um, one thing about Myanmar is that overall, we are dealing with a very young workforce. And I believe um, this also has um, an impact on the fact that this may very well be the first global crisis experienced by people in, in Myanmar. So what are some of the implications on the workplace that we're gonna to touch upon today? Has this crisis brought us all together a little bit more than before? Has making work from home and has, has making uh, work and home settings indistinguishable, has that humanized the work environment and our relationships with our coworkers? Or has the way we run our teams and businesses perhaps shifted for a, you know, towards a more results-focused approach? But one thing is increasingly clear, and that is this crisis has the potential to be the accelerator for one of the greatest workplace and business transformations in our lifetimes. And I truly believe that this has the potential to give Myanmar that push that businesses needed to leapfrog and take a step back also and rethink how they operate, optimize their people and processes, and set up themselves up for another decade of strong growth. So what can we all learn to do in this period to emerge stronger than ever. And that's why we brought to you today's event, really. It's for you to learn from expert multinationals how a crisis of this magnitude is managed, help you ref refine your plan of action and policies, and help strengthen the voice of HR within your organization. And particularly today, we're gonna be joined by some of the most expert HR professionals in Myanmar truly going in a lot of detail about how HR can really be that strategic pillar within an organization that it needs to be, particularly during a crisis of this magnitude. You're gonna have the opportunity to ask a lot of questions to a panel of experts, and uh, please do that at the end. We'll prepare uh, a Q&A uh, session for you. Now, before I go uh, into the panel discussion, we have a very special guest today with us, Mr. Mahesh from PwC. PwC is one of the leading management consulting firms in the world, and uh, they have a strong presence in Myanmar. They are very uh, close to a lot of the largest companies in the market during this period, and Mahesh is going to share with us some of the insights that they've analyzed and, and, um, and, and, and researched about the impact of COVID-19 in Myanmar. So I will now bring Mahesh with us, and uh, he's going to present to us uh, the rest of the presentation. So good morning, Mahesh. Good morning. Good morning, Matt. Um, thank you for the introduction, Matt, uh, and Mingla Bhatt, everybody. Uh, hope all of you are staying safe and your families are safe as well. Um, in terms of uh, the presentation today. So Matt and team asked me to share some insights on how businesses, or what challenges businesses are facing in the current environment, and what would be some of the effective steps that businesses can take in order to prepare for what's clearly going to be the new normal way of operating. So I'm going to do that today. So my first part of the presentation, next slide please, is about the impact on Myanmar businesses. Uh, next slide, please. So the impact on businesses uh, in the current state can be cut into four distinct buckets. The first one is clearly uh, the impact on the workforce health and safety, travel restrictions, of course. And as, as Matt uh, mentioned about the survey, uh, a lot of remote working happening or work from home happening. There are businesses that are also facing challenges in fulfilling the contractual obligations from a, uh, from a services delivery point of view. Uh, almost all businesses, uh, except some sectors specifically, are facing declining revenues, and that's impacting their cash flow. In fact, there is going to be a study that's coming out next week, which will talk about the state of uh, businesses in Myanmar specifically, 
and, and uh, how some of the businesses have been very challenged with cash flows. They're still okay, so many of them, but there is likely to be a crunch coming in, in the next couple of weeks. And finally, um, the entire uh, ecosystem of supply chain and the operations that is getting disrupted uh, in this environment, because this is not just about Myanmar, it is also about whether your supply chain is actually international. So you are dependent on some other countries. So if it is domestic, then it is a lot of impact coming through the factories and, and uh, manufacturing units in Myanmar itself. Uh, next slide, please. So we um, asked uh, in a webinar very recently conducted two days ago, we had a webinar about these topics in detail. And, and there's, a, there's a link uh, on our website, on PwC website. I do not want to repeat that because you can look at that presentation in detail and uh, the video. Um, we asked the question uh, during the webinar, what is the biggest challenge the companies are facing? So while many of them responded to declining revenues and cash flows, one of the other big challenges that people talked about was working from home for their staff and the management teams. Uh, and I decided this is what we're going to talk about today to give you some more insights in depth as to what the businesses need to do to prepare for the new normal. Because after all, workforce are the backbone of the company. Right? Uh, next slide, please. Some of the comments that we've heard from people, uh, which are our clients, uh, are, are on the screen, as you see. And, and there are challenges about working from home, which some of us uh, can relate to directly, and many of us uh, probably experience parts of it. The, the basic fundamental thing, and I'm on a lot of calls with my team members in Myanmar, and a lot of times I realize that suddenly their, their audio, their video suddenly stops, and it's because there's a power outage. So they have to wait to, to either the power to come back or immediately switch to their mobile phones to be able to connect back onto the call. That's a regular recurring challenge that happens. There are challenges where a number of clients have had all their infrastructure and systems set up, but they do not necessarily have the VPN set up. They do not have the ability for their people to log in to the respective uh, ERP systems that they have in the organization. Um, and in these times, especially with people working remotely, there is a big concern on businesses from a business perspective on the, the openness of the information uh, because people are working from home. There is a lot of sometimes confidential information uh, that is open. And since a lot of people are using their personal machines or laptops sometimes to connect to some of these calls uh, or, or to connect with their colleagues, there is definitely a big data security risk that is happening. Okay. Now, all this does play into HR in a way, not just about cyber and all, because a lot of it is related to the policies of how to work from home, the procedures on how to work from home, how do we enable our workforce to work from home. So that's why in the context of this conversation about HR strategies, this is quite relevant to think about. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, let's talk about what uh, businesses need to do to prepare for the post-crisis period, what, what would be called as a new normal. Um, and uh, on, on the next page here, uh, next slide please. The first thing that we, we're telling our clients to do is to actually set up a crisis management team. And it's not too late to do that because there are different companies that will go through different stages of this type of a crisis. Some of the companies, especially the MNCs, will have a pretty good standard crisis management team already set up or a very clear business continuity plan. Some of these need to be re-looked at in detail. And when I say that, I'm talking about this from four different aspects, of course. The first one, of course, is how do you manage to uh, stay in touch with your customers, make sure that you still have the revenue slowing in. Um, but the bigger part is how do you make sure that your workforce is actually able to deliver the work that will be helping your customers to get the services or the products that they need. Um, of course, the operations and supply chain is another key part, but the other key part is about the communication strategy. How do you actually rapidly communicate to your workforce? How do you rapidly communicate to your customers and, and, and to your other supply chain partners? Uh, specifically, in terms of the workforce, uh, there are implications. And, and um, being based in Singapore, doing a lot of work in Myanmar, uh, I, can, I can tell you that there is significant impact for businesses like us, for example, because we're not able to travel. Uh, and second, even our local team members who are based in Myanmar have challenges when they travel to locations outside and they come back. We want to make sure all our workforce is protected. 
So there need to be certain quarantine measures or self-imposed stay-at-home measures that we need to impose on some of our team members because the risk of infection is always there and we want to make sure that we contain it as much as possible. So the workplace safety and planning is quite an important thing to consider from a crisis management perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we enable new ways of working? So for the businesses, and I'm sure the panel will pick this up and discuss this at length. So the, the key things I'd like to sort of mention is uh, the new normal is now and it's happening. Uh, what that means is companies will have to think about are there additional solutions to, to be able to uh, stay in touch with customers and provide the services and products to the customers. From a workforce perspective, how do we enable our workforce to collaborate more effectively? How do we make sure that they're able to work remotely? And in, the, in certain emergencies, have we enabled the workforce, given them, say, data cards or dongles or mobile phones, et cetera, for them to be able to connect back to the office and do the work that there is required to be done? Of course, I'll talk about the part where it is not a remote workforce and people are working in the office. That itself will have certain challenges. That's going to be on my next slide. But in addition to that, a lot of work has to be done by your technology teams to enable this infrastructure, to be enabled, to enable the applications to be able to connect remotely, which probably in the past was not a big consideration for many of these uh, applications and for your team specifically. So the key four measures that need to be thought about definitely is the digital and physical security, the protection against asset loss and misappropriation. And from a risk perspective, the internal controls that need to be there both for your uh, documents as well as for your systems. Uh, next slide, please. So what's your new office going to look like? Now, why I call this as a new normal office is because uh, increasingly governments are mandating uh, that there be a certain parameters around social distancing, that there is clear segregation of, uh, of, of workspaces, uh, that we do not let uh, employees congregate in one area. Um, and all this is for the benefit of the employees, of course, and for the companies and to keep the economy going, uh, to make sure that there is, uh, the risk of uh, transmission is minimized. What that means essentially from an office perspective is the very first thing that happens is the occupancy ratio of the office goes down significantly. Simply sharing from our office perspective, if there was a big long desk where six people could sit, sit previously, with the new measures that are there in terms of social distancing, we know that two of those chairs cannot be used. So as a desk which used to have six people can now accommodate probably only three people. That means it's a reduced occupancy for the entire office as such. Uh, we also have had to, as many of you would have had to mark out your office spaces to, to be very clear about which areas people should not congregate and which chairs they should not sit on or which desk they should not sit on. Uh, there are, of course, temperature screening measures, which the government has mandated. Uh, many of the companies are looking at safety apps, which uh, can broadcast um, information to employees in, in one shot, especially if they do not have direct access to email at that point in time, at least using WhatsApp or some other technology like that. Uh, of course, there's increased focus on sanitization and the need for hand sanitizers and masks to be provided to the workforce, uh, staggered office hours. Uh, and the last one, of course, being self-quarantine, because there are people who will still be traveling, will be coming back from different places. How do you make sure that there is some self-quarantine measures that you have so that the rest of the teams do not get impacted immediately and are safe? So it is the new norm of the office. Uh, and trust me, this is one of those big things which will also impact productivity going forward. And that's why I call it the new normal way of working. Uh, next slide, please. And one thing that um, Matt talked about is the acceleration of digital transformation. Um, many companies historically who have had certain levels of adoption of digital have had to relook at what they can do immediately. But one of the things that I advise companies to look at is um, there are certain things that you need to digitize, uh, digitalize in the current stage in the first one to three months. But very quickly, you also need to determine what are the other things that you need to put on a digital journey so that uh, the new normal is fully enabled, not just for now, but for the next future uh, few months, because we do not know when this crisis is gonna subside uh, and what else is gonna come our way. So the adoption or the acceleration of digital transformation is another key component. Uh, 
I think these are the key things that I wanted to share. Uh, I know this was a 15 minute slot. And what I hope to do was, um, uh, the next slide is just uh, a slide, I would say it's Q and A. So happy to take questions if any. Or Matt, you can tell me how we're gonna do this. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, very, very insightful. And um, yeah, so thank you. I think I'd like to encourage everybody to uh, write down people's emails. We will make these emails available after the, the webinar in case anybody wants to reach out to Mahesh and the rest of the team. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you, Matt. Matt, just FYI, there are some questions already coming up in the Q&A, and I'm sure you'll pick it up later. But I'll be yeah. online, you can, you can direct a question at me later if you need to. Yeah, thank you, yeah. So, what is the topic of today? Uh, again, um, we're gonna be centering around the impact of COVID-19, particularly on HR, on human resources, on people management, on talent management, and how this global crisis has had a very deep and uh, profound impact on, uh, on, uh, on the workplace. Today's session is divided in three main building blocks. The first part is our speakers are going to cover about has the role of HR shifted, changed, as they had to adapt to a new, to a new, um, to a new norm? Um, has the priorities of the HR department had to change and shift depending on the company's needs? The second part is we will be talking about employee well-being. So how um, the whole aspect of managing company culture and motivation and engagement, how has the HR department had to adapt and manage that uh, in, 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 in organizations? Um, and the last part, uh, which I'm particularly interested in, is going to be about how we can turn this crisis into a massive opportunity for businesses. Can in any way a crisis like this actually be somewhat of a good thing for organizations? Maybe take a step back, clean up a lot of those back-end processes that have kind of been put on the back burner for a while, and actually use this time to really reflect and plan the next decade of growth. Um, so with this, I'd like to now introduce the speakers for today. So we have a really awesome set of speakers uh, with us today. We have our moderator, Mr. Vivek from Grand Royale Group. We have Ms. Laura from Prudential Myanmar. We have Ms. Yemon Cho from AIA Insurance. We have Mr. Tajinder from KBZ Bank. And we have Mr. Shivam from Nestle Myanmar. So without further ado, I would like now to pass it over to Mr. Ajinder, once we put on the videos. Okay. Hello, good morning, speakers. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So, Mr. Vivek, good morning. Good morning, Matt. How are you? Um, may I ask you to turn on the video? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so everybody's here. And uh, now, uh, Mr. Vivek, I'd like to pass it over to you. And uh, if everybody can see my slide, I believe this is your introductory slide. Yeah, this is my introduction uh, slide, Matt, and thank you very much for organizing this. I think it's a great opportunity for people, all of us, and all the team members and all the other HR professions in Myanmar to head strike as to what role we play and what we can do. But before I start, just a background, what Twitterhouse uh, was sharing, and in a webinar a few days back with Umang uh, New, uh, the permanent secretary, of MIFR and he was mentioning it is a time they have given a lot of approvals but money coming into Myanmar is just 1.19 billion compared to 3.3 billion which was approved by the Myanmar government earlier. So all it is as was mentioned in your slide a tough time for the big industries as well as the SMEs because the SME is where Investments actually help the growth and help the people, which that business operates all are suffering because of this corona virus which is there. And 
uh, is that nothing is going to recover at least till the end of this year. And that is why we gave the EERP the economic package with all those 72 actions and seven goals which they gave. Uh, now, from a perspective, if we see what we are playing from a human capital perspective, is that we have to take care of the health and safety of our employees because that is where our major roles play. Uh, most of them I have been talking to converted their office into A teams, B teams, some had the business continuity plans. But where it all leads on, and that is where I put this slide together, where at the bottom where you say the well-being and care, that is where we start coming in and playing our strategic role of the human capital fraternities too, because the businesses definitely want performance, though the market is closed, but definitely there has to be something happening because the business has to keep running. And there has to be a lot of communication happening and connection happening. So when the business leaders ask us that, how are you going to measure performance? What will you do? KPIs will not be met, et cetera, et cetera. The advice which we say, and that's what I think my panelists would further throw light on when we move into their things. But my take on that is that obviously there are required to have regular check-ins. If we can have a daily morning call or a daily just check up on a Viber group, just to say what things are working. And obviously encouraging our people to do, like as Mahesh was mentioning, there are these uh, problems which happen where people are on the call, suddenly the internet goes off or the light goes off. So instead of getting uh, disturbed, I think that's where we need to motivate our people to keep working on seeing that how the employment conditions which people are working from home, they are not in the office, so how can you keep them happy? How can you keep them motivated? Those are things which we need to keep working because people working from home when they are teleworking, on one side they get a call from the boss, we need to do this. He may not have the infrastructure, so the way do we come in to play this thing? And on the second aspect is how do we keep connected? Because unless people are connected, they will suddenly become disengaged. We know for sure that uh, JobNet only organized that uh, webinar a few months back where we were talking for the war for talent. People will start jumping jobs. It's not that Myanmar job market is down. If you go to the JobNet site, one can see that a number of new openings come up every day. So people obviously will, if they are frustrated, they may start looking at something different. And that is where our role starts playing that how do we manage the people's emotions? So at the end, it all boils down to communication, communication, communication. And how do we do proper time management to that? Now, based on that, just to set the tone, I would welcome my panelists, my co-workers who are there over here. So we have Sajinder from KPZ, we have Laura from Prudential, Yimon from, from the AIA, from, from Nestle. Uh, Next slide, please. If we move to the first topic, what we want to talk about is the overall impact of COVID on the HR team. So when we're talking about the overall impact, there are parts of organizations which have very well adapted to the crisis. Some parts of them are not so well adapted. So let me turn the mic on to, let me start Prudential because insurance is very important in this time. So, Laura, what are your views on that? Thank you, Vivek. Um, yes, there are a lot of uh, impact in every aspect of the business. So, uh, uh, especially our operation. For us, uh, we haven't we haven't started our operation yet, but it happened. So, we have to be creative enough and think out of the box how we will launch our operation to start uh, selling things. So, yeah. Uh, but the good thing is, uh, before we uh, start, we are, uh, as um, just uh, one of uh, the speaker has mentioned earlier, we already have uh, digitalized in every aspect of the business. So it's easier for us to transition to that, that uh, working from home and then arranging the um, operations. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. That's good from the insurance. Now, let's move to the bank. Like, Pajinda, what have you been doing in KBZ? Um, I would uh, request uh, 
fellow panelists to go on mute, otherwise there is a lot of echo. Uh, thank you, Vivek, for asking this question. I think being the largest bank of the country and employing 15,000 employees, the, there are several things happen. But the first and foremost, our priorities changed. So something which used to be business as usual for human resources function, all of a sudden employee well-being became very important. How do we ensure that we continue to reach out to the 15,000 employees on regular basis? As you very rightly mentioned, communication is important. How do we reach out to so many people virtually became important. The, and, and then things did not come out in black and white. Uh, the COVID-19, it evolved and it continues to evolve. If you see the first advisory, which I sent out somewhere in the month of March, we mandated that masks are important. Then subsequently for next few advisories, there was no communication on wearing masks from CDC or from World Health Organization. And towards the you know, end of 40th day or 42nd day, everybody started saying that masks are important. Earlier people were talking about that the COVID-19, uh, the virus, uh, the longevity, and then it doesn't stay on a glass surface and it would um, uh, die automatically within a couple of hours. And then people started saying that uh, it can survive up to eight days. So from the human resources function of KBZ uh, Bank uh, perspective. I think the biggest challenge was assimilation of a lot of data which was happening in the big wide world and ensuring that you are able to succinctly communicate to all the employees um, in, in the language of their choice. That was a most important uh, dimension. The second important dimension was that we have our employees who, were, who are interacting with customers and then 500 branches. So, and then yes, there are digital channels, there are ATM, but um, it, is a, it is a cash based economy. So when you are dispensing cash, how do you dispense cash? How do you continue to count uh, currency notes without worrying about them? How do you, ensure that there is there are adequate uh, gloves, plastic gloves, and simultaneously you are shifting through those weights of currency notes uh, in an easy manner. So those were the ground level challenges. Strategically, I think uh, we wanted to live our uh, value, which is uh, the meta, and we wanted to demonstrate uh, that this is the time when we would stand with the country, we would stand with our employees and our employees who are foot shoulder soldiers. So we came out with something called a special allowance for employees who are actually in customer facing areas. Um, I'm talking about people who are dispensing cash, people who are going out um, and filling up ATMs uh, so that uh, people like, um, um, you know, average citizen, if, if they want to withdraw cash out of ATM, they are not um, uh, in, in short of cash. They are, the ATMs are functional. These people, they were at high risk. And we decided that we would come out with some kind of incentive plan to reward these people not to take and simultaneously educate them that they don't take undue risk just for this reward. But our reward was a way of saying thank you. Um, I would take a breather here. Do you want me to go on? Because there is a, there is a lot which you would do in a, a large institution, Vivek, but um, have I answered your question or you want me to take a breather and uh, uh, you want to go to other panelists? Thank you, Dhanendra. I think uh, that's uh, fine for this because we'll have more questions on which we would look at more of the stories from your end because you have the largest population in the country working for one single organization. So we'll move on to that. So let me move on to Shivam. So Shivam and Nestle, what have you been doing? Uh, thank you, uh, Vivek. Uh, I think as uh, Tejinder mentioned, there is a lot of things that we have been doing. But if you would notice when Mahesh was presenting, I could not uh, contain my... Uh, 
smile because all the challenges that he was mentioning and uh, the actions that he mentioned to address those challenges that is what uh, we have lived through at nestle over the last two months so mahesh I really appreciate what you have put there uh, because i have seen these challenges and the actions working for those challenges uh one thing that i would specially want to add in terms of nestle was that uh, for us our approach was to uh, the very famous quote that uh, plan for the worst hope for the best that has actually been our approach uh, to give you an example in late january we were already uh, doing our business continuity plans in uh, middle of february we were already planning what happens if we have to move to remote working and by early march we have already tried how we will do a work from home so what happened is that while we did not panic and move to these things but because we had tested all those things as of now we have our supply chain which is pretty well equipped so in spite of having a lot of imports our business continues to operate for work from home the challenges that mahesh mentioned we were able to catch those challenges in early march while we had not really moved on work from home but we had just trialed it for a few days and then we were able to solve it so that when we had to actually move to work from home we could start much quickly so i think that is the one thing that i would uh, want to add and this continues to guide us we try to look to my ahead in the future and plan for the worst but yeah that doesn't mean that we start acting uh, in a pessimistic manner we just plan so that we can react very quickly thanks shivam that what so uh, what the basic point which i get from you is that pre planning helped a lot in your case yes uh, let me move on to yimon like i know you've been doing a lot of work because we see a lot of good works about you so what would you like to share what has been the impact on your hr team you need to unmute yimon your unmute yimon your aya oh yeah, thank you yes. can <laughs> thank you vivek uh thank you to uh shivan as well for sharing and i i i feel very inspired to hear how proactive nestle has been and for for um eia the challenge on the the impact on insurance you know insurance is the least i mean uh, compared to other sectors because insurance is one of the least uh, impacted sectors for now uh but for us is also uh in in terms of planning and preparation in january when we hear the cases um in 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 china in, in around the world uh and in we started actually uh the business continuity plan where we actually start thinking how we're going to split the teams how we started to make sure that our it team has all the vpns installed in all our teams and we we had the microsoft teams enabled and we also have uh we also shifted the training uh in early feb to all the virtual uh training program so it's not entirely virtual training yet uh to our sales force it's like half half and we we already started experimenting the virtual training and in that virtual training uh, also comes about closing the sales virtually rather than just uh uh going you know uh, face to face meeting so building trust in in the virtual meetings etc so we uh, i think in terms of uh the preparedness we actually made sure that we are we were prepared since we started hearing the cases in the neighboring countries in china in uh in 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 yuan countries uh in in terms of but we are lucky that we are a te technology enabled uh company so we are digitally ready uh but in in other hr aspects like uh starting to make sure we stock up <laughs> the masks other hygiene sanitizations um uh, for the office for people etc so these are some of the groundwork that we have done and um, also because of the covid the other aspects in our changes in hr is really adapting to in just just like you have mentioned like you have adapted uh, how how you care how you connect and how you actually uh, uh uh shift performance paradigm you know in in assessing setting the kpi so from all aspects of the hr journey as well we have a lot of adaptations to make like in engagement we actually change it into we, we become more creative in virtual engagement activities making sure people are connected um uh you know 
within teams with the leadership between between the leaderships and teams as well as the cross-functional teams um and in yeah the so connection i think is very very important so yeah being prepared being digitally enabled and and actually shifting and adapting some of our hr journey processes actually help us uh, 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 survive and thrive through this COVID-19 impact. Great. Thanks, Yimun. That's, that's really interesting. And that's uh, something which is... Uh... Now, one question which I will have for all of you at this point of time is that I know most of uh, the organizations have of us, like either they're in the MNC category or they've got some guidance from their headquarters or they're pretty big. But the major impact when it comes to the SME and I know many of the participants on this call will be from the SME sector. They will be wondering that what is something the impact of COVID on them because they may not have proper HR teams. They may have one HR individual doing something. So anything which you people believe is what can be their in point and how would you like to address it? Anybody, I'll just open it up. Anybody wants to add their value to that? Uh, I think for uh, please Laura, please. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I think for SME, um, uh, of course, whatever we share, it will not be applicable to SME. But one thing, uh, what they can do is in terms of the communication, uh, because SME is uh headed most right. So uh, whether the every employee may have a uh, fear of uh, like losing job or whether they, their salary will be cut off. So in that sense, uh. Uh, communication is key, even if the hard decision need to be made. So everyone need to be on the same page and consistently communicating to all the employee is key. That's what I think. Sure. So very, very valid point about comforting communication. That is very important. Shivam, you were saying something. Yeah, uh, I actually also wanted to add that perspective that uh, while I've worked with multinationals uh, for all of my career, in fact, this is the crisis where I most feel like an SME. So it is a global crisis. Uh, our head office teams are busy solving their own problems. Uh, if I look at just my Myanmar team, we are not really, we cannot do centralized one size fits all approach also. So we have, now we have approaches for our field teams, separate for our factories teams, separate for our office teams, separate for expats. So uh, one thing I just wanted to say that possibly this is a time where even uh, we are all in it together and uh, the things that we do possibly will apply to all of us together in Myanmar. Thanks, Yom. So that, that validates the point what uh, Mahesh was mentioning. This is the new norm and we all are learning a lot. So Tejinder, you've just unmuted. I think you want to share something with us. Uh, yeah, surely. Very gladly. Thanks, uh, Vivek. Uh, so three messages uh, for friends, um, HR colleagues uh, from SME sector. Number one, that there is a lot of similarity. One, that employee well-being and employee safety practices. I would say that you can just cut copy paste from what large companies are doing into your small companies and then just tweak depending upon what your specific circumstances are. Safety is about the lives and COVID does not differentiate between the employee of a large organization or a SME. Rather colleagues from SME are under a lot of pressure because your profile of your workmen may be of a type, may be of a type, where they do not have a lot of awareness. So I think when it comes to safety, you can just cut copy paste in terms of well-being, the pressure of losing the job, the pressure of what is happening, the pressure of where is the world going to. I think they are common to all human beings. So there is a lot which you can you know, take out of this workshop and then several other um, uh, practices of large corporations and then, then just cut copy paste. So that's my point number two. The point number three is that this particular crisis is not only about money, it is about lives. So 
seeing COVID from a financial perspective only would be a lopsided view. We have to see how people can take care of their uh, elderly members in the family, people, uh, how they can take care of their colleagues or people who have special circumstances and communicate it back. As a HR person, given you have um, access to this information, I think as long as you are able to communicate and then relay all of these um, things back in your organization, you have done a phenomenal job. Yeah, that's my input, Vivek. Thanks for asking. Thanks, thanks Ajanda. That's really great. Uh, so uh, this uh, brings us to the end of the first topic, what we wanted to talk. So we'll uh, have a short break here where we would request the participants that who is uh, whoever is on the call, there will be a small poll question which you need to do. So it's time for a snap poll. There are these couple of questions which you would like to, we would want you to just vote. So I'll just give you a minute to just go through this and vote it until I get my go ahead. Then we'll move on to the next question. So please pick up your computers and just vote fast. Not a very time consuming thing, but it's required so that we get inputs and help JobNet prepare some better webinars as we go forward. Okay, so I think you would have done that. Now that brings us to the next segment of this where we would like to have a little bit of a discussion on. What is the role of HR in managing the employee's well-being? Because as Rajinder just mentioned that whether it is an SME or a large organization, employee well-being is the essence of all this. So I would ask uh, you people to elaborate a little that what is the approach your HR has played and how fast, like I know one of you mentioned that you've been planning for the last few months, but how do you manage the culture and keep the employees motivated because Though Rajinder mentioned the thing about uh, keeping motivation of the people who are customer facing, but now you've got a large population of 15,000. So you obviously have this big hat of making sure that everybody is working on that. And in your opinion, what should be the priorities which our other colleagues can hear from us? What when business is undergoing this crisis? Uh, there are cost pressures, there are other things, and we obviously have to do certain things which does require some funds. So how are you people managing in your area? So this time, let me start from the other insurance experts. So Nimon Cho, let me go to you first on this. Yeah, you need to unmute your mic. Hello. Yeah, now we can hear you. So, yeah, so from, for the employee well-being from HR perspective, I actually see this in three parts. And the first one uh, is the physical well-being. So making sure that we are actually following all the health standards in the office, you know, um, uh, giving them uh, the hygiene products like uh, sanitizers, making sure that our whole environment is uh, very is sanitized. We have deep cleansing in the office. So very, very that we can provide in terms of uh, physical well-being and the other is the other thing is uh actually making sure that we are digitally enabled to let to make sure people can work from home so we have been working from home um uh, uh since uh the like beginning of the march we have started we started with a team split then uh like in mid-march uh we have been working from home totally unless we we need to actually come to office uh for a particular purpose so but mostly like 80 to 90 percent of the workforce has been working and they have the option to work from home uh home completely uh and and also we 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 have been providing some virtual exercise programs to to our 
uh, colleagues for their physical well-being. So that's uh, from physical well-being perspective, which is um, uh, easy, uh, which is easier to see. From psychological, mental, and emotional well-being perspective, uh, making sure that people are are connected, not just like I said before, not only within the teams, but also with the leadership, with the uh, with the uh, cross-functional team. So uh, providing, be, becoming more creative in connecting them through uh, some fun programs like Netflix, you know, uh, some exercise challenge together um, and, and photo contest, you know, or singing and dancing contest, et cetera. So, so make, making them feel that they are part of a big team because sometimes when we all work from home, we come to feel like, am I alone? Even though I'm still connected with the team, uh, my team itself, like every day, but sometimes we may forget that we are part of a bigger organization, bigger things, bigger cause. So it's important to, um, to uh, very often remind people that we are part of uh, the, the big, bigger organization, bigger part and bigger goals, et cetera. Uh, and from the, the, also from mental and physical, uh, psychological well-being perspective, one thing that is very important to do is making sure that people are involved and see what is happening next in the organization, especially in these times of uncertainty. We can communicate to them that they are jobs that will not be impacted, but at the same time, you know, helping them be aware how strong we are and, and also that they are in this together, making sure that we are strong as a company together so that in the next phase, we are ready to, to actually face the other challenges is important. So we involve the people in our brainstorming sessions on what's happen, what will happen next, how will, what we see uh, for the future, and then what we can do together, you know? So, so and also for leadership team being available um, uh, to people, checking in with people very often, you know? So at least each department heads uh, actually check in with their team every day. Uh, and then mm -hmm. we actually make, make it a practice that the leaders, the ESCO members, as we would actually randomly call people to, to make sure they are okay, et cetera. And sometimes we send in some, but for teams, we, we send in some high tea sets, you know, we actually have the tea party together virtually. So the, these are a couple of things uh, what we, we, we have been doing to make sure that emotional and mental well-being of the people, you know, feeling that they have that, that support mechanism there. And the other aspect is, I think, is very critical for HR people. Uh, is the financial well-being of the employees. When we say financial well-being of the employees, it does not mean that in times of crisis, we have to be increasing their salaries or whatever, but it's just making them, you know, feel secure in, in that. Uh, I think one of the best gifts that our HR uh, practitioners, our HR health, uh, the HR people could actually give to employees is really a strong and growing organization. So from that aspect as well, you know, working uh, very closely with the leadership team uh, to make sure that our business can survive and thrive in this environment and, and mm -hmm. actually get it together to look into the possible potential futures on, on what could uh, be the aspects. Like I actually learned from one of my, 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 my good friends uh, from uh, Cosign from Yuma Bank, the, the uh, chief learning officer as well, that shell, one, one shell uh, actually was prepared for the futures uh, of the, the disaster impact. They, they actually, uh, they were able to actually survive through a disaster because the, their business was able to survive through that. And I think it's time for the HR professionals right now as well for all of us to actually be able to work with business very closely and be prepared for what could potentially happen. Uh, what are the impacts? What would, what would the world be like after COVID-19? Uh, what would the new normal world would be like and how could we prepare from like organizational systems, processes, people capabilities. Uh, you know, one thing for sure, like people's agility, adaptability and resilience, which we have always been uh, developing for uh, people, uh, that becomes more important right now. So, so what systems, processes, what capabilities are required, uh, what new practices need to be embedded and then start actually working on these in coordination with the business and making sure that our business can survive and thrive uh, in this COVID and after COVID would, would be one, one well-being aspect that we can look at for. Thank you, Iman. Thank you very much for giving uh, detailed insight into this. So, uh, 
that uh, can move to you because uh, I know you've done a lot, but uh, if you would give some guidance in terms of the role of uh, what colleagues and the other HR community can do in terms of the employee well-being in this time. Uh, thanks, Vivek. I think Yomon uh, uh, Imon uh, made uh, phenomenal points, uh, very valid points. Um, in order to build on to what she said, I think this is the time when authenticity is needed the most. It is important uh, that um, friends who are on the call from SME organizations to talk to the senior management and understand as to where are they on on their journey and it could be the financial journey could be organization organization's ability to tide through issues uh, there some of the organizations would face significant um, uh, revenue loss some of the organizations would see business model changing some of the organizations it, th there would be a business reality and if hr colleagues can understand that business reality and ensure that employees are aligned to that business reality and employees can understand what they can do, what they need to do in these difficult times uh, for everyone. Uh, and then that authenticity, that appreciation, that genuineness would be the key to transition successful to the successfully to, to, to the next uh, stage of organization's life and, and an employee's career and employee's uh, continued employment. Uh, that's point number one. The point number two is equally important. I would say that this is the time for HR colleagues to anticipate what are the needs of the employees and also sensitize the top management about that. I mean, within Myanmar, there are several success stories. Um, some of these business heads came and met with me uh, unofficially over a coffee that how do we handle the situation? And this is a very large hotel chain. And then their CEO was talking to me. And then the discussion was that instead of having everybody work for eight hours, uh, can we have more employees work for four hours every day so that there is some continued income for two times the total count of employees who can be employed for eight hours. Um, out of the box solution. And then he called back and gave me feedback that it is working very well. Employees uh, gave him feedback that this is the time when they needed organization support the most. And they're so glad that the organization is doing that. So I think it is the time when they have to think out of the box to meet the expectations of the employees because employees also have very different expectations in these times. Organizations, yes, there is an economic reality, but for employees, there is, uh, you know, they don't know how would, um, uh, how would it impact their career. They don't know how would it impact their financials and how would it, impact their continued um, um, happiness. And then in case they have moved from one city to another city, then how would it impact them? So these are the two things which I would say on top of um, what uh, Iman uh, covered. Uh, there are several other things in terms of employee well-being and uh, the safety dimension, but they would go into the medium term or long term, depending upon whether we have the V-shape, U-shape or L-shape uh, recovery, um, you know, definitely uh, people are talking about accelerating digitization and then accelerating uh, long term change agenda. But I think we can cover that in a separate call. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank, thanks, Tijana. Thanks for the insight. It's really good that uh, transparency, authenticity are the key to these things where HR will manage the well-being and let the people's uh, worries be laid to rest. Otherwise, obviously, everybody is in a different mind frame. What will happen to you? So uh, let me move on to Shivam. So Shivam, what are your views on uh, how the, what is the role which HR is playing in terms of the employee well-being? I think uh, Imon and Tejinder made very valid points and uh, we have had those similar experiences. Uh, one thing that I would want to add and which has been working for us uh, has been that as uh, Tejinder mentioned, this one is this crisis is impacting everybody. And obviously it's much more personal. 
so when we look at our organization we we have to look at different teams and then we might even have to go to each and every person who might be facing a challenge so somebody might be worried about their family members who are at high risk what if they get infected because the person has to work in the field somebody might be worried about that okay i am a very senior manager how will this impact in terms of my career somebody might be new into the role and having their own plans to be a high performer this year and now everything is going downhill so the, everybody might have very very different concerns uh, from their safety from their families from their even day to day working their income all of this and that's why one thing uh, uh, that we have actually been doing and it actually came by learning is that we have to implement proactive listening what i mean by proactive listening is let's not wait for people to come and tell us what do we do we are in stress can we actually be proactive to bring those concerns out and we have to be very personalized about it now how do we do that uh, we actually started because initially when we obviously moved we we were hearing for all these different concerns coming up and we were not sure that okay how do we solve for it because every employee had a very different personalized concern and then we implemented a, 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 a initiative in our company where we said uh, like i think imon also mentioned that daily the line managers and the leaders need to connect with their team members but what we also did was that we gave them a very simple framework which had seven steps on how to do that conversation and this okay. was there to actually bring out the concerns that employee would have in their mind let it not build up for the next one month and then it comes out to you let let's listen authentically that okay this is the concern and then maybe we can plan about it there were other things uh, that we have actually been doing we did communication sessions and honestly they were tough uh, we did not have an answer to somebody saying that what if uh, while working in the market i get infected and i infect my grandma it's very tough to answer that question on a public forum but i think that's where what tejinder mentioned that is where authenticity comes in it's a crisis and we still need to go and listen to it and then come back and try to do our best and obviously when you do this listening then the second part is to communicate back and that is something that we have been doing uh, uh, initially we thought that okay we need to do a fixed frequency okay every thursday or twice a week but what we realized is that this situation is moving very fast and that's why what we said is that we communicate whenever we need it so there have been weeks where there have been communicate all our company organization five times a week there have been weeks there where we have only communicated twice there are weeks where we communicate only to one of the teams so we do that we listen to each and every person we implement mechanisms for that and then we try to com- communicate back to each and every person also and uh, as a latest uh, step again in that direction of proactive listening we have launched a pulse survey in our company so we are trying to we have designed a questionnaire to get feedback on the concerns that we have observed and trying to see where we have reached with all the actions in next one month and again where can we go further so i think if i have to add to what uh, imon and tejinder said i would say proactive listening would be one thing that we need to do to ensure the well-being of our employees right that's the sense of proactive listening and connect as and when required these are really very very important right and uh, let me move to laura before i can share what we've been doing in grand royal so laura over to you Okay, thank you. Uh, so my fe- fellow panelists has shared all the good points. So I just want to add in one point that Shivan has shared: proactive listening and proactive uh, uh, involvement of HR is very important in this crisis because we have to make sure that uh, HR is not only leading but also the. the leadership team is involving together and then we need to listen to our employee how we can support each other right so we as a team leadership team has to make sure that our employee has a sense of security and 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 what we have done a couple of things which is we find is successful is we have done our first virtual town hall section with all our employee where we share the business update what is going on how we are doing well so that they have a sense of uh, security that even though we are in crisis we have good things are happening and we celebrate the wins even if it is the small wins 
And another thing that we have done is we use every possible communication channel, not only emails, but also team, but also uh, WhatsApp group to share information up to date because there are a lot of announcements coming up from the government these days, right? So sometimes uh, they may miss out. So we are regularly updating what the government uh, precaution measure. So we have to update to them. And um, before we do the work from home arrangement, we did a uh, proactive listening. Uh, one thing is that that time people are, pe most of the people are doing like panic buying. So our employees said, oh, we also want to do it. So what we did is we released our uh, salary like three days earlier than our normal day so that they can buy the stuff needed for them. And another thing that we do is, uh, Sometimes we, we do engagement activity, which may, uh, some of the employees may not like it. So what we did is we asked them what kind of activities they want to do together. So we come up with the weekly Wednesday uh, virtual yoga class where we all get connected to each other and we share yeah. what is our struggle this week before we, we, we do the yoga and, and, and have the mindfulness yoga section. So that one is really working well for us. And another thing, another aspect that we are uh, planning to implement is extension of the leave. Because some people, uh, they have carried uh, over leave during March, but they cannot take it. So we will be giving extension period for those people uh, for the leave carry forward. And another thing that uh, we are also doing is just like uh, Shiva mentioned, we just launched our employee survey this Monday to make sure that uh, um, we are listening to them and then we want to know what we can do much better uh, even though we are giving a lot of support to them. So that's, these are the couple of things that we are doing. Yeah. Great. No? Thank you very much uh, for all the insights. So I think the crux which comes out is that we are obviously starting from basic hygiene, what we are educating the people which started long back. Uh, in our case, like we being an alcohol company, obviously we could not get hand sanitizers, so we used our alcohol to make hand sanitizers and we gave it to all the employees. We even donated a lot to the government because it was not available in the country. So those are things which can be done. So those are small, small things. But as Tajinder rightly mentioned, one thing which should be clear even for the small or the bigger companies is authenticity in your communication because people will see through if we do anything make some wrong comments so even if uh, i know there are people who've been asking this question what if people have to be sacked do we tell them now now whether we tell them now or not but we do not know what will happen in the future but being realistic and being truthful about the whole thing i think that will be the main thing what we can do for the wealthy being of our people so on this segment let me just stop here and ask the participants for this uh, small poll which will come up on your screen, those questions if you could just answer, I'll just give you a minute to answer those questions. So Matt or Greg who is putting up, please put up those questions. Okay, so let's move to the final segment uh, of our section where uh, obviously as uh, Mahesh mentioned in his presentation before we started is that every cloud does has a silver lining. So in these times when we are working and I understand most of you have been sharing during the earlier sessions about what things are happening in a different environment like Trina mentioned thinking out of the box, getting some new creative ideas which may work even going forward and which may keep people even more happy than what they are today. So if you could share some stories which have happened in, uh, in your areas which you've seen, because one thing which I noticed, especially amongst the panelists and all of us, like Laura, your employees have been posting a lot of positive comments that what they've been doing, how they're very happy doing yoga, blah, 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 all those sort of things. Obviously, all of us are doing a lot of things, but your company has been talking a lot about these things, all your employees have been putting. So there are things which are happening. And obviously, there yeah. is good from all of us that uh, what we all can do from each other and what we can learn from the others also. So 
let me just uh, go around the block once more and if you could share your success stories what is happening what is good about this whole crisis because everything cannot be bad there has to be something yeah. good like i yeah. i know for sure like uh, my daughter has taught me how to play tennis and i have lost 3 kilos in the last one month so which i have been trying for <laughs> one month. so that's been good for me i think that's be good news for a lot of other people also so yeah. let me on and say that what are good things what can happen what hr can initiate or what your companies have done which people can also learn from it and feel happy about it because covid is not the end of the world we will get over it and we'll get back to normal but in this interim how do we know that there are good things happening so let me start with uh, shivam this time shivam you need to unmute your phone before you start yeah yes sir uh, uh of course actually i, I would say not a, a few silver linings uh, there are a lot of good things that have happened and uh, i'm sure that they will continue to happen uh, I, i think the first thing that actually comes to my mind I, i've seen it bringing uh, leadership behaviors very clearly from some of our team members and that is something very close to my heart i uh, to be honest even with my hr team i have been really proud of uh, some of the team members of how we have acted Uh, the same leadership behaviors also come out across the organization uh, i think uh, vivek you mentioned about uh, supporting the government with sanitizer so that is something even with nestle we have continuously been involved in the local community in this crisis so while we were solving the issues of our employees solving the issues of our business but people were also concerned that okay we need to support our community so we we have been working with the red cross we have been working with a lot of healthcare centers uh, uh, in terms of supporting them and uh, obviously this panel itself is something that i would credit covid with uh, all of us uh, hr industry professionals coming together uh, discussing the common crisis that we are ha having so a lot of things and why i say that uh, it will continue to keep adding good things is uh, if uh, uh, i don't know if uh, one of my favorite change models is the quarters eight change uh, step change model right we talk about creating a sense of urgency and that is where uh, i've been part of many change projects in past and creating that burning platform is actually one of the critical steps right that we do as a project manager when we are doing the change and right now yes it is a very tough crisis but also it is a bur big burning platform so which will is going to result into change whether we like it or not the change will be forced upon us now it is up to us that whether that change results in a lot of failures or a lot of successes and i think that is why i would expect that lot of good things will also come out yes there will be lot of challenges but lot of good things just to give some examples of things that have been happening in our company uh, let me not going to the details but uh, we have a premium product that we believe is the uh, possibly the best quality product in its category but due to the packaging concerns we only sell a, a, a high volume sku a very big large pack for the product obviously this product we have been struggling with consumers going and trialing this product because it is only available in large pack now with the covid crisis a lot of stocking up happened and this product has a high shelf life and we are seeing off the chart volumes for this product now for our marketing teams and sales teams this is a big opportunity it would have taken them years to ensure that such a premium and product which is only available in a large pack to get generate these many trials so now our consumers know this product and now we can capitalize on that if i come back closer to hr uh, we are actually starting with uh, somebody who is doing a project with us sitting in paris somebody with an excellent profile uh, in terms of our business uh educated in europe somebody which we would never have been able to afford being a myanmar market because talent like this has uh, global opportunities typically working in europe or america but we were able to actually get this talent to work, do a project with us because of the coronavirus situation because things are not happening in europe plus all across the world uh, remote working has been forced so these two factors coming together we have somebody who might i don't know how much that this kind of a talent can contribute we have never had somebody like this come and support our business and for the cost of a local talent in the current situation so uh, for me i think yes there are a lot of good things that we have seen not to obviously disregard that it is a very tough situation but what i think is all of us are going to change and we are going to see a lot of good things coming up as we proceed through the crisis 
Thank you, Shivam. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me move to Tajender because I know KBZ has been doing a lot of good things. We've been hearing a lot of people talk about. I don't know KBZ is not posted on the social network, but a couple of my employees come back and give me examples of what their colleagues in KBZ are going through. So I'm sure there would be a lot of good things happening at your end, Tajender. Uh, very kind of you to uh, say that, uh, Vivek. Yes, we are doing a lot of uh, positive things, and I would, um, I can go into the details, but that would be uh, that has been partly covered in one question or the other, uh, because uh, employee well-being, and I said that Meta is one of our values, so we ensured that uh, uh, the physical safety as well as well-being are given utmost priority in this uh, this time so let me answer the question from a broader perspective and and then obviously uh, you know i would i would first pay uh, regards to the 300000 deaths which have happened globally and then we have lost uh, uh, these uh, these fellow um, uh, human beings but in terms of if I have to talk about the, uh, the, the opportunities which have come in the market, I would say that the biggest opportunity in the financial services industry is all of a sudden going from a cash economy to a digital economy and uh, leapfrogging, uh, I would say, that 30, 40 years, and this is the, these are the initiatives from the Central Bank of Myanmar, and these are the initiatives from uh, several other um, bodies which, which govern this kind of, um, these kind of transactions. Uh, that is a game changer. I mean, all of us know that uh, Myanmar is a cash-based currency, and now we are talking about uh, KBZ pay, and then you can do so much, you can even, uh, borrow against KBZ uh, pay. Unsecured lending was unheard of. And similarly, people are talking about checks. People are talking about um, how you can uh, make uh, touch uh, cashless transactions and then touch-based transactions rather than manual um, handing over uh, cash transactions. So I would say that in the banking space, that is a very big opportunity and that would touch everyone, yeah, whether it is a SME or a large corporation. Keeping, keeping at 30,000 feet, I think the biggest opportunity at this time who want to buy um, their houses, their apartments, and uh, enter into long-term investment decisions, infra decisions. Um, and then I would, okay, now, so that's, that, that was a big picture. Now, coming granular, I would say that uh, um, keeping oneself safe and ensuring more, um, uh, paying more attention to the hygiene, paying more attention to here and now, and then how are we interacting with our colleagues, not in terms of, um, no, not in terms of, it's, it's not only transactions, but the value we attach when we are interacting with our colleagues, are we passing COVID unknowingly? How do you take care of the group? And I think everybody in Myanmar has shown huge respect to fellow colleagues by ensuring that the COVID has not spread that much within the country, within organizations. We have the lowest rate globally, uh, even there are not too many deaths, touch wood, um, God is kind. So I think there is some level of either resilience or some level of carefulness. I think that speaks volumes. Uh, it's, it's not something which should be um, uh, take, taken lightly. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge achievement in itself. And uh, I think um, uh, it, it, it should be continued 
with with a positive um, um, uh, celebration. That is what I would say, Vivek. Okay. It's really thrilling to note that uh, there are these things which are happening. People are obviously, they are looking at new ways and the new norms which are coming into play. So let me move on to Laura that what positive things have you been doing to make your people so happy? Uh, yes, I see this situation. There are many good things happening. Uh, one thing is we are uh, before that we take many things for granted but now like even connecting with the, our colleague in personal touch and and then uh bonding has been happening across organization and among team and another thing is we have been talking about uh flexible work arrangement way before we started prudential myanmar but we thought that it will take more time right with this situation in myanmar digital and all those people mindset but for me i'm happy now that people are forced to change their behavior to to work from home and to to be adapt to the flexible working arrangement so uh, uh, even if we overcome this situation i think it's easier for extra people like me to implement the flexible working arrangement and, and in that aspect for our colleague from sme they can think about what are the roles that they can um um let people to work from home so that they they need to spend a uh, lesser amount of money on the physical working space, right? And um, another thing is, um, uh, in terms of the employer branding, just like you mentioned, yes, our people are posting a lot on LinkedIn, Facebook. So that's a good thing to attract uh, other talents to our organization that, yes, we as an organization, we take care of our employee. We make sure that our employee are safe and uh, their well-being is our utmost priority. So yeah, so for every organization, and I encourage you all to do in that aspect, this is a very good time for us to promote our employer branding, just showing that you care for, our, for your colleague and you as a leader, how you are making sure that your people are, are safe and your people have a sense of security. Great, Laura, thank you very much. Let me move on to the last speaker, Iman. What are the positives which you see this COVID-19 bringing? I think you need to unmute, yeah. Sure. All right, thank you, Vivek. Um, so I, will, I want to actually talk about it from the, uh, I, I, I see a lot of silver linings in, in this COVID-19 uh, impact as well. So I want to talk about it from the country level, organizational level and individual level. So from the country level there as well, there are a lot of silver linings, you know, the government and also the business and NGOs, they have all stepped up to respond to this and it's really uh, phenomenal. So the, 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 the amount of effort and the, the sincerity that people actually put in to, to step up and respond to like Grand Royal actually providing sanitizers to uh, the, 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 the hospitals. Uh, in, in also, yeah, a lot of, in, in a lot of aspects, uh, that's very phenomenal that has shown people's humanity out of this situation so and also the our government has actually come up with the comprehensive COVID-19 response plan which uh, will be inclusive of which will be very inclusive so I hope this this things will actually push through and in IMF has and also our doctor Dr. Tem Yiu has mentioned that this it's time for us. He he is an uh, at the he has always been the policy expert with the UNs, and now as well he's actually uh, mentioning that this is time for us to reimagine Myanmar economy. Maybe this is even time to reshape our economy and and position ourselves in the global front line. Uh, so I think that that, that that sounds very optimistic and positive. And IMF has also. Uh, projected that our GDP will continue to grow. So I want to say that please, our our SME colleagues as well, our uh, our business leaders, you know, HR colleagues, uh, not to be disheartened by this situation because there there could be a lot of positive um, things uh, come out of this, and we could re-steer this in in the positive direction. Uh, and also the uh, talking on uh, talking about that, um, you know the. Uh, that's yeah, yeah. So and also, like like internet has. This is not the. Yeah, this is a pandemic, and this is a big thing. But 
it's not that we have never experienced uh, uh, some kind of uh, the the huge Im huge events which change the global business outlook or in our in our local business outlook. Just to talk from my own experience, uh, when the plastic became you know started to be popular when I was young, and in my hometown uh, there is a family working on rubber, you know, um, they, they actually make handicrafts the rub with the rubber materials and like they actually have like bucket, you know, uh, uh, bucket glasses, etc. So they, they actually sell these materials and when the plastic became popular and disposables came in and this family went out of business and from the um, um, uh, top level perspective, we would say, ah, this family was out of business because of the plastics. Maybe not necessarily because of the plastics, but because of the ability to adapt to and change the situation. So, and also a lot of businesses globally, locally have adapted uh, uh, the way they uh, they conduct the business. Um, just like Grand Rival to do with hand sanitizer, doing the hand sanitizer now. And in some uh, French companies, uh, the, the, uh, the perfume companies have also started doing the ventilators for, for, for the patients. And so there are a lot of ways that the businesses have become very creative to adapt to and, 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 and lead this change. And also the other positive things that could be happening in the country level as well is in our country, the behavior change uh, sometimes, uh, could, but not only in our country, in every country, behavioral change is tough. And right now, it's in certain industries uh, where we need to actually change behavior of consumer behavior of the large scale, like fintech, you know, like IKBC, our, uh, our colleague that has mentioned in, in uh, how we can actually push through cashless society, you know, through uh, uh, from uh, COVID-19, like e-commerce industry where people uh, do not actually believe in buying things online, but now that they are forced to. And also uh, in, in terms of insurance, the uh, people may, may not have uh, seen the need to actually uh, have the own the insurance protect themselves financially. Maybe this is time they actually start seeing the need. So, so from the country level as well, behavioral changes are happening. And I think this new way of, I mean, uh, these things will actually last even after COVID-19. So the businesses that can adapt, that can actually uh, 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 change themselves and being resilient are the ones that would survive and thrive uh, after post, post this pandemic as well. And the third thing is about the individual level. Um, and I would like to encourage if, if there are our colleagues, you know, uh, uh, coming in, tuning in um, from, and having some, some worries or anxieties around the, the outlook across, I would like to say that, you know, some internet has actually ban banished a lot of businesses, but it also has brought on a lot of new uh, emerging businesses as well. So there will always be opportunities for people who can adapt and willing to learn and change um, uh, uh, in different sectors, maybe green technology because people start to see the need to protect environment. So, you know, there, there will be, I'm sure there are uh, potential industries that we have not discovered yet will come up and and, and create lots of opportunities for people um, over COVID-19. So please don't, I mean, uh, use this as, the, as, as an, a time for us to actually learn ourselves, you know, uh, have a lot of time to learn, adapt, uh, build our resilience and be prepared for the next move. And also because the government interest rates are going down, it's, it's maybe it's time to start thinking about your online business as well your own business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. That's uh, really great. Like I, I, I get reminder, reminded that once upon a time when I used to work in China, they have this signs which says that on one side, the Chinese alphabet, it read crisis and the other side, you look, it read opportunity. So if yeah. I'm, I'm not a Chinese, I can't remember that script, but they used to show it in all our programs and tell us, well, every crisis has an opportunity. And here also, I think, uh, we are obviously it is a pandemic so it is a crisis but there are a lot of opportunities we've been hearing from all of you what you've been doing and 
I read that most of the uh, IT companies globally have decided and there were news that 85% of the workforce will continue to work from home and they will not bring them to the office. So they will free up office mm -hmm. space, reduce their overhead, reduce expenditure. So a lot of things are happening, creativity are happening. So that's a silver lining from the business for the people, for everybody. You mentioned that you were thinking since January to implement flexi hours, but this came as a blessing in disguise that you automatically implemented flexi hours. So that brings me of uh, this session, and I'll request the participants to do a final. There's a small poll which will be coming up on your screen. Those two small questions, if you could. Add, and uh, in the interim, if I could request. Matt or Greg, if you people have compiled the questions which you've taken, we can take it from. Okay, so as the audience is uh, answering the questions in the poll. I will um, pick two or three questions from the audience, maybe four if we have time, and uh, I'll pass it on to you guys. Um, so the first question uh, is, I guess, uh, not for one particular speaker, for overall, uh, can you shed some more light about how can we find out more about staff sentiment, morale, uh, how can we survey staff? What are some of practical examples that you guys have uh, implemented that have been working well for you? Maybe a quick round, um, and then we move on to the next one. Okay, so uh, let me start because uh, the uh, the staff sentiments basically comes from talking or taking surveys. So you've just heard Laura Shiva mention that they launched surveys, so people can do a simple monkey is available free of charge. You can frame your questions, what you want to hear from the people. That's what we do generally. But we have a morning call meeting call with the managers. Like in my case, like my I have a call with my HR team uh, to understand that they in turn have it with their. So we follow a calling tree concept, which one piece has a conversation with people to understand what's happening. And those small group calls can give up their inputs, how people are feeling or what are their biggest concerns. That's what we've been doing for anybody else okay anybody else wants to add to this yes, yes. for us um yeah you will go ahead <laughs> laura go please ahead. go ahead okay <laughs> yeah for us what we do is people will be shy to speak in front of a big crowd of the people so what we do is our ceo has been arranging one-on-one -on -one with each department to listen to what they need what kind of support uh, we need to give and what are they struggling so we have been doing this uh, over time thank you okay. yeah you yemon <laughs> yeah, so I, I think uh, what Laura has uh, actually mentioned is the perfect example of actually checking in without needing, I mean, service would be helpful, but at the same time, you know, having the personal touch, you know, making, making, checking in with people, checking their process uh, through our leadership team is important. So in our organization as well, we have been, our school, our executive teams have been always checking in and being connected with uh, the people throughout. So they are absolutely comfortable uh, to share their thoughts, their uh, concerns, you know, uh, uh, so et cetera. So that's what we have been doing. And if we want to do survey without actually costing us a lot, there are a lot of um, uh, online survey options that we could also uh, do uh, and see whether, we see, see if they want to actually say anything anonymous as well. Or even the very simple thing for our SMEs, like suggestion box, you know, or, or the box you know, and close box for people to go in and, uh, and, yeah. and give the letter, give the uh, uh, concerns to, to, to yeah. the respective the heads yeah. and leaders. Oh. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, I'll, unless Can I just add one thing, uh, Matt, to yeah. this? Uh, yeah. Uh, so actually, so similar to like Laura mentioned and uh, Iman also mentioned, we have, we have done surveys and uh, we are doing communication sessions to get people's feedback. 
but in addition one thing that we have done and which was more on the lines of what prajender mentioned being authentic uh, what we are doing is that our field population whose jobs cannot be done from work from home and they are the ones who are most exposed what we have been doing is that for the past few weeks every week we have had one senior leader actually go and work with them in the field mm -hmm. so that is the opportunity where you show solidarity you show appreciation and then all the surveys and regular daily catch ups that we are doing we actually see that what is happening on the field and recently mm -hmm. just to accelerate that we on one day we actually ensured that all of our leadership team as a surprise visit everybody went into the field one morning to work with a different uh, field population who are working with the healthcare centers or in the food and beverage sector the modern trade sector spend time with them and have discussions on all these things that we have been doing so that was to add that factor of authenticity and get real feedback which sometimes obviously gets missed in the surveys or communication group communication sessions yeah okay that's great and then i have two questions which i'll, I'll merge into one from uh, miss inyin pu and wei pyo cho so uh, they're asking basically um um you know now with everybody working from home do you foresee even after uh, the, this this crisis and work from from home mandates um will companies continue to work from home what will be the new policies what are the some pros and cons or will everything just go back to full time in the office what are your thoughts as i was mentioning in the summary comment that the big it companies globally have already made comments that 80 to 85% of the workforce will be operating remotely after the covid is over so in myanmar there is a thought which people can think i have not heard people talking uh, not even in our company but there there may be thoughts which people can think that if they want to reduce there are not any customer facing roles which can be done then obviously that can be done but that's again a company decision but i know like for example rajender's business of a bank where there are customer facing people they cannot do such thing but in our case where a factory is running we require people back office operation can be done i think like the travel industry or the uh, service people can work from maybe on the insurance side any any uh, you guys are have demonstrated today uh, uh, particularly of being very forward thinking and innovative in your approaches so um, uh, what what is your view is you know are you guys you know not going to go back to the office at all or uh, what's going to happen <laughs> yeah for now uh, for us even though the government will be allowing us to go back to office but we ask our employee to stay working from home even uh, uh, till when the all the situation is getting better and another thing is we are thinking to come up with a policy to practice formally this working for home arrangement even if this situation is over interesting yemon so well yeah we we this have always tested the, you know the new way of work so we are actually seeing that working from home is very effective uh when we actually started implementing work from home the worry we had was would people become that would productivity decrease you know would people and uh fall out of the engagement etc but in we actually see the reverse trend and people have been uh, uh uh being very very proactive in their communication they're available throughout and and in productivity even increases more and also the danger of it is actually it starts to creep into the boundary which means at the office we could say like after uh, our certain hours maybe we continue working at home for a uh, for few more hours then we're dead right but we as always have the boundary in and set as in okay when we are home we can already start uh thinking about our personal life but now that combination of personal life and work becomes so blurred uh that the the concern we have is like for me personally even if i i normally send emails in the uh, evenings and late evenings as well just to make sure you know I don't forget and and I send emails and the normal response normally when we were working from home my team would respond to me the next day and now that concerns me because they responded me immediately and then we were like chatting 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 over email and then we don't sometimes stop so so one thing I have been doing is really timing my emails to make sure even if that goes out of my box today to make sure it goes tomorrow so so and i think with work from home approach 
it, we are very we see that it's very effective we could continue and we are digitally enabled um, but the question of whether we would continue to do it for 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 after COVID is something that we all have to uh, uh, see and decide together as a business uh, but for, for for sure flexible you know uh, working arrangements can, can be made uh, and, and we are seeing that people, our people are very passionate to to even their things they want to come back to so but what will happen next we it's it's good that we are prepared now but after covid how we would respond how whether we would go work from home completely or not would um be dependent on a number of other uh key factors to consider so uh, i'll need to say for now but for sure we are ready to do that now as a business yeah matt mahesha can i just provide a, a additional course. view so um what's happening in terms of um, the world uh, and other companies that we see in the region there's historically been a challenge uh, the challenge has been that there are uh, different sets of people who uh, leave the workforce at different points in time for specific personal reasons. This could be primarily because they need to look after kids or they need to look after aged ones or they need to have sort of certain time uh, uh, of their own in a work day. And uh, this leads to often a loss of talent over the years uh, in the workforce. This COVID situation has opened up, as, as I think Vivek was saying, um, an opportunity. So what the crisis has shown an opportunity where this remote working, after years of trying for many companies, many companies have to just transition into this mode overnight. And it is shown to companies that this can actually work. And I think, as Yuman was saying, many people are getting comfortable with it. And that's why I call it the new norm. So just as a, as a simple thing, I mean, in my organization, we are thinking uh, close to at least 16% of our people might opt for what I would call flex hours. Flex hours means that they would probably come into the office only when they absolutely need to. The rest of the day, they would probably just work from home. And when they work from home, they would probably have different flexible hours to work from, uh, but find the common time to actually interact with their colleagues and need to collaborate on certain things, they would do that. Uh, and so this opens up a new opportunity in terms of attracting people that previously might not have joined the organization because there was an opportunity to work remotely and things like that. So it does open up new avenues. Just want to share that with you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Particularly on the millennial uh, segment, right? Um, and um, one question, uh, another question for the speaker is, um, uh, I guess part of the one of the challenges perhaps you guys have faced is also this this idea that um, um, uh, family members uh, and I see a question referring to the question from Nilar um, uh, perhaps family members uh, uh, worry and fear to the point that they don't allow other family members to go to work even though uh, employers from those family members have put in place all the right safety measures and precautions. Um, and, and, and so how do you deal with that? Is it a communication issue? Is it a, uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, Matt, it's, it's a one, yes, it is a communication issue, but it is a fear of the unknown which people have, because and you just can't wipe it out on the carpet and say, no, you have to be there. So as I said that, uh, taking a clue what uh, Mahesh just mentioned, that if the people can work from home, I, I don't, reason and over a period of time I think all the companies even in Myanmar have realized that if things can continue working from home why not that that is the concept which is working like just to give you our example we evaluated that if workers have to come to the plant because the plant has to operate can we defer of the plant up to the time when we really have put all the measures in place so we've been working in the two weeks that like in our case their belt is running, people have to stay, they cannot stand six feet apart. So what can we do to meet the criteria? So a lot of thinking went into that. Some people who came, their brainstorming sessions were held to see. And now when people are coming, it's been communicated, those photographs of the uh, new layout have been sent to them on their WhatsApp and the other. So their family members are pretty uh, happy. But as I said, if family members are concerned, there's something which the company can come up with communication that this is all what we are doing 
in case you feel safe, come. I know it will be difficult for the SMEs in this matter because it requires some funding, which may be difficult for these small uh, enterprises to do. But again, education and taking safety, in my opinion, works. This has worked for us at least. Yeah. Um, Matt, the other thing what you what um, organizations can do is uh, do differentiation as to uh, people above 55, they have more propensity of um, getting infected by COVID. Uh, people who have certain medical conditions, uh, ladies who are young moms or uh, ladies who are in the family way. Uh, so differentiation and then in case there is a group of employee or there is a particular employee who has high propensity of uh, getting infected, I think uh, isolating them and uh, then providing more data uh, in, in terms of how the employee can stay safe and what organization is doing in order to keep the employees protected. And then in turn, what to do so that employee does not end up passing these, um, the, the infection to family members, all of these things will help. Yeah, and, and while uh, on you, Tajinder, I, I have two questions that are very relevant, I think, in your case, given the sheer size of your organization. Um, one being, um, I would assume with 15,000 people under, under uh, um, you know, all across the country, one issue is probably the fact that not everybody has email IDs. So one of the questions from the audience is, um, yes, there are all these tools and we, we can try to be as digital as possible, but for some parts of the organization, it's very challenging because they might not have the right tools. So how do you, how has, you know, perhaps KBZ, what is your view on that? Uh, and, so, um, yeah, I, so would, I, would, I would, I would pass a uh, secret out. So Myanmar, uh, every employee will not have the email address, but uh, the smartphone penetration in Myanmar is 130%. So there were, there were times when an important message was to be sent out. And at six o'clock, I decided that uh, there is, this is a serious communication and it has to reach out to all employees. By 7.30, I had reached out to 15,000 employees. That is the speed of communication which is possible today. Um, and then this is a real life example. This is not being concocted. Uh, that's point number one. Then there are platforms where it's communication is very unique. You can bring people to a platform and you ensure that communication is on the platform. So we have uh, certain uh, platforms um, where people can just log in, sign in, and then see what is the latest employee communication or employee advisory on COVID. Um, in fact, we decided that we would run one training program uh, on that platform, and we had more than 1,500 employees logging in at the same time, and the, uh, the infrastructure, uh, telecom infrastructure supported that. So there are a number of ways of doing it, yeah. Okay. Um, and one last uh, question here, I would say uh, probably again more relevant on companies that have uh, 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 staff on, on field. Um, there's one question from the audience saying, how can you encourage, uh, motivate um, your, your workforce, particularly uh, staff field operations uh, who are out there? Uh, what's your advice? Who has in the who of the speakers have a large dispersed workforce? Uh, I can yeah I can take a uh, start and then then uh, fellow colleagues yeah. can uh, pitch yeah. in. I think it is it is about communication. It is about um, and and also doing a lot of work to ensure that they are safe. So I remember uh, one particular night um, we had to disinfect around twenty five offices. And we are talking about thorough disinfection and uh, the team literally worked overtime to ensure that um, the offices are disinfected properly. There are temperature uh, scanners at place uh, at the entrance so that anyone who is going in, the temperature monitoring is happening. And um, then uh, we had to ensure 
employees who are coming in, uh, those those of uh, the employees who had to come in, they were wearing masks, they had gloves, there was they were in appropriate safety gear. So I think it's so it, it's two ways. Organization have to do their bit and do it honestly, genuinely, thinking that employee welfare and employee safety is most important. Second, employee has to understand what has been done, what can put him in trouble or her in trouble, and ultimately put everybody else in trouble. So I think it's this kind of you know two way streak. Yeah, that's my take. Okay, fantastic. Um, I want to add something, uh, Matt, in, in here. Uh, yeah. Even before we start, uh, I, I was actually talking with Shivan uh, on that the, the fact that the leadership team, their leadership team actually goes out on the field and, mm -hmm. and that's a very good demonstration of authenticity, etc. And the other thing we could do, and I, I have been seeing some banks do, is uh, the, 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 uh, giving them the sense of purpose so the reason why uh, why they are are they are actually out on the field that just like the president has also mentioned uh, that we we are actually helping them see that by, by them actually walking they're actually helping uh, a lot of people secure and and stay from home work from home because uh, financially they 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 if they enable the fintech sector we can actually do the transactions uh, safely so given that some software actually give people a lot of uh, um, a lot of courage and, and motivation, even when they are out in the field, they are they are there for good. They beyond okay. their own. Yeah. Makes sense. I think just one additional example of a company that um, that that had to deal with um, uh, people in the front line, and I, th I think Tejendra mentioned this earlier that this is not just about uh, the financial survival of a company; it's also about people. And it's about lives. Uh, they did end up doing a survey internally to check in with their people on the front line to see whether any of them had any vulnerable members in their families, in the immediate family that they live with. So there were people who were identified as people living with their very aged parents or parents who had other underlying conditions. These people were given other options to see whether they could actually do some other role in the interim and somebody else could take that role on the field. So these are some of the things about, it's all about a period of demonstrating empathy and support communication. I think all the panelists who've given all these real life answers today, I'm, I'm absolutely impressed with, with the words that come out. And uh, I think Matt, this is, this is what companies need to follow. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, again, I, I, I want to echo your words. I am also very impressed with the outcome of today. Again, this was our first webinar. I think uh, um, I'm very pleased uh, with, with the outcome. And on that, I would like to now, um, so I think there's no more questions. I think most of them, virtually 99% of them were answered. Uh, and so thank you for that uh, to you speakers. And uh, I'd like to now uh, share my screen and, and, and uh, offer some concluding remarks. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, thank you all for joining today. Uh, here are some uh, uh, key takeaways from today. You may take a picture of this, uh, but we can also perhaps post it later uh, to the people that have attended. In, in summary, um, as uh, as uh, Shivan from Nestle mentioned, uh, their quick approach was uh, was uh, something that really put them in a strong position from the beginning. Plan for the worst, hope for the best. Um, as AIA mentioned very quickly, uh, you guys have transitioned to uh, full online training, including sales, uh, which I, from what I understand is a big part of your organization. Uh, AIA, again, uh, again, uh, essentially, we have to be, all, be more creative about how, uh, how, do we, you know, how do we approach HR, in this case, find more creative ways for employee engagement, such as an online singing contest and so on. Um, I liked uh, what uh, uh, Tejinder from KBZ mentioned about staying true to your company values and really ensuring that you live up to those and use this as a driving, guiding principle throughout, uh, throughout a crisis like this. Um, at an SME level, very important to be consistent in your communications and do not neglect the safety. As Mr. Tajinder mentioned, the uh, COVID does not discriminate and doesn't really uh, know whether you are an SME or a, or a large company. It affects us all, it has affected us all, and it will continue to affect us all. Do not disregard employee well being because the pressure to lose uh, jobs and, and the uncertainty in the economy is high for everyone. 
Overall, uh, there seems to be a very strong agreement on the fact that HR needs to have a very proactive role in the organization, particularly around managing the authenticity of communication to employees. I think this has been a crucial part of the last part of the, of the webinar today. It's about really ensuring communication is authentic, is transparent, it's truthful, and that will lead to increased trust and loyalty from, from your own uh, employees. Um, increasing overall, not just the authenticity, but also the um, frequency and the channels, right? So we've heard from Prudential, from Laura, about virtual town halls, but also alternative channels such as WhatsApp groups, right? Uh, tying into also what the gender was saying that yes, not everybody might have an email ID, but everybody has a smartphone. Most likely everybody has Facebook. So probably there are alternative ways where you can, you know, if KBZ managed to reach 15,000 people within a matter of hours, I think we do not, none of us has any other excuse really to uh, not reach anybody uh, very quickly. Um, uh, from an S Nestle point of view, uh, we've heard that um, HR should have a very active role in sensitizing management towards the needs and expectations of the employees, and particularly around uh, implementing real practical and proactive uh, frameworks for, for, for line managers to communicate with their own teams. Do not let it, um, you know, as, as I suppose there is some uh, loss in face-to-face productivity, we need to ensure and probably complement by having even more structured ways of working and in, like in this case, a very uh, sort of checklist type uh, daily communication uh, guide for, for your online managers. In conclusion, we've uh, spoken about what are some of the good things that can come out of this. I think there is a very famous saying in political science saying, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And I think, um, um, you know, we've touched upon some of the really important things here, but I think overall the, the trend seems to be that this is definitely an opportunity for Myanmar to review and reimagine uh, the economy. And within, uh, within our own spectrums of domains and, and influence, we can uh, take this time to really review and reimagine our own businesses. Um, from KBZ, we've heard that this crisis is definitely accelerating uh, the transition of Myanmar to cashless. And uh, I also didn't know this because it's quite interesting about unsecured lending uh, with a, a, a digital uh, process as well. Uh, from Prudential, from Laura, we've heard again that uh, this time is a good opportunity for them to implement flexible working arrangements and also forecast what after this crisis will be perhaps the new normal in terms of flexible working arrangements. So starting to test these policies now, uh, understand what people want, and perhaps looking at drafting some of the policies that will be able to be implemented even after all this is over. Um, we've heard very nicely from Laura, again from Prudential, about employer branding. Again, uh, uh, we're all connected these days, and I think uh, as companies, we do have an opportunity to, uh, you know, to think about how we can use this in our favor in terms of employer branding. People post and share, uh, you know, of course, also negative things, but also a lot of positive things. And I think this is a good opportunity for organizations to uh, be out there, be more uh, present and top of mind, and attract and retain better talent. And lastly, I think uh, we've kind of, this has been a kind of like an underlying trend for all responses. I think uh, it's an opportunity for companies to definitely look at more technology tools, uh, you know, kind of take a step back, look at all the back office processes that have been uh, never really uh, looked into detail and implement digital where possible 